and welcome to Literary Prospects, where we talk to authors and literary professionals about books, publishing, and the writing life. I'm Kelly Vick. I'm the host of the program, and in just a moment, it will be my pleasure to introduce today's guest. But first, a reminder that if you like what you hear, please do take a moment to subscribe. It helps us out, and you can make sure you never miss an episode. Also, we've opened a literary prospect shop, so if you're looking for bookish shirts, totes, and gifts, please check that out at literaryprospects.etsy.com. And to grab books featured on the podcast and check out more curated book lists, you can visit the Literary Prospects bookstore on bookshop.org. We'll leave all those links below in the show notes. And now, let's introduce today's guest. Elizabeth Berkland is the author of three novels, The Dressmaker, The Runaway Wife, and most recently, A Northern Light in Provence. Prior to writing novels, Elizabeth was the personal finance columnist for Cosmopolitan Magazine and a full-time freelance writer for national magazines including Glamour, Self, and more. She served on the boards of the National Humanities Center and the Center for Fiction and received a fellowship from the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. She lives in New York City. Elizabeth Berkland, thank you so much for joining and congratulations on your new novel, A Northern Light in Provence. In a starred review, book list says A Northern Light in Provence is beautifully written, deeply immersive, touching, and intellectually challenging, with each savored page a gift, utterly compelling and deeply satisfying. Publishers Weekly says Brooklyn sets her enchanting tale of love and loss in exotic Greenland and sun-dappled Provence. She constructs a rich world replete with real emotional stakes and lovely insights on how translation relates to life. This sumptuous tale deserves a wide audience. Author Christina Baker Klein says, big hearted, whimsical, and enchanting. A Northern Light in Provence is more than a delightful escape. It's an invitation to explore the potential of human connection. And author Lauren Balfour says, with its heart stopping lyricism and immersive story, this intensely moving, vivid, and evocative novel stayed with me long after I'd finished it. The questions it poses about life and love continue to haunt me. So with that, what can you tell us about A Northern Light in Provence? How would you describe it? Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, also for hosting me tonight, today. Um, yes, so I would describe it as uh, it's about a woman named Ilse Erland who lives on a, in a cottage on stilts on the west coast of Greenland. And she is a translator and has been asked by her publisher to translate the work of the last living troubadour of Provence, the, the poetry of him. And so because this is complicated, because the, the, a lot of the poetry is in Provençal, she convinces her publisher to send her, pay for the trip to Provence, a country that she knows well, but and has translated the, the literature of, but has never been to. So she arrives in Provence, falls in love with the, the small hilltop village that the poet lives in. She falls in love with the poet, and then the poet's son arrives on the scene. <laughs> There's a teaser. <laughs> what was what was the spark that that got this story started for you? So the spark was the concept of translation. And I have read translated works for most of my life and always wondered what was behind that translation. What, how close to this work was the original work? And, and I actually took some courses in translation and realized how completely difficult, impossible it is to get it's so tricky to get the tone and the feeling and and so and you realize that it's not word for word it's translating is not a math it's not one plus one equals two it's one plus one equals two thousand and you're translating a culture really and you have to get used to imperfection and in and approximation really and so all of this really intrigued me and so I thought, let's have my character be a translator. And, I, and this way, we can both explore the territory. And 
Your protagonist, Ilsa, is from Greenland. And that remote place and culture uh, is really brought to life on the page. You described it a little bit for us earlier. What drew you uh, to incorporate Greenland specifically so, into the novel? Yeah, because I I want wanted the the biggest thrust of the book to be about translation. I thought it would be interesting to have this character translate place as well as words. And to have, I knew, I'm a Francophile, so I knew she would end up in Provence, or maybe not end up, who knows, but mm -hmm. she would go to Provence, so, and she would be translating, uh, friend, she would be translating English and, and Danish into French, so I wanted her to be, uh, I wanted to be, her to be far enough away so that the contrast was good, and Greenland, I, I have my, on my father's side, I have Danish heritage, and Dan Greenland is an autonomous territory of the Kingdom of Denmark, and also one of our, not relatives, but our last name at one point was Rasmussen, and he is a hero in Greenland. So I thought, why not explore Greenland like Rasmussen, who was an explorer? Why not uh, be like my ancient uh, ancestors and do a little exploration on paper instead of in I don't negative 95 degree uh, <laughs> so I got the easy route well you wrote a first draft am I right without visiting Greenland but right. then you did go can you talk about that yes Brilliant. so I did write the first draft and my editor said um, so when did you go to Greenland and what was that like? And I said, mm, never been. <laughs> and then I said, but I'm going. And she said, you know, you're going to Greenland. You know, she was mm -hmm. sort of surprised. And then I, I said, well, you want to come with me? And she said, sure. So <laughs> the two of us set off for Greenland during, well, yeah, during the editorial prize process. So it was very tricky because here was my editor who was going to see everything I got wrong from the, in the first draft. Oh, so wow. it, it was, I had to, I had to know my facts and I, so she was a firsthand, firsthand, truly firsthand, uh, fact checker on this trip. And we, uh, we had a wonderful time and we went directly to Ilulisat, which is where the book is set. And the, that's a bigger town with 4,000 people in it. And the smaller town, is Okwatsut, where I had my character live, and that has 30 people in it. And I did I did have to change some things. Um, I got the landscape pretty well, but I down, but I did not get the fact that the little town where where my character lived had no roads. And in my original draft, there were driveways and there were roads and vehicles of all kinds and this time so I had to change that so this little town I mean and, and Greenland is interesting in that there are only 90 miles of, of roads in the whole country wow and 40 of which are paved so you're because there are so many little finger peninsulas the the best way to get around is by boat or by plane or by dog sled but um so anyway, we, we had a great discovery trip. We, we also, other than the road thing I changed, uh, I added a lot about the sounds that I couldn't get from the mm -hmm. visual internet and my friend's descriptions who are explorers. I added the boom of the icebergs when they're calving off the uh, glacier. So there's a, a regular boom that goes on and it's kind of the boom of doom because, you know, that's the melting planet. But um, also there were the dogs in the evening, the dog, the, the Greenlandic sled dogs are mm -hmm. chained outside the villages and, uh, and they would start to howl at dinner time. So that was a sound that I hadn't had in my first draft. And, and then there were a few other little things that my editor caught me on like the hockey team that you'd think that hockey would be a big sport in Greenland. It's 80% of the island is ice, but soccer is the sport. So I had to change the, uh, there was a hockey stick. And so I had to change that. And 
a few other a few other things but there's nothing like being in the place to yeah. get the feel oh that's fascinating yeah so we have greenland and then we have of course provence um and there is a love of french culture and language that that shines through um in the novel what about france and provence in particular speaks to you right well i have um uh, i've been i guess i've been tuned into france since third grade when i had a french teacher sort of like my character ilsa she was inspired by her French teacher, and I was inspired by this woman with her red lipstick, similarly. And she, um, but then, and then we went on a trip, my family went on a trip to France, and that sold me with the French bread and the Fanta orange soda. And mm -hmm. the, we were in the south of France, so we hit the topless beaches, and I was just, this is crazy. This place is cool. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, that was that was a great trip. And then since then, I've, I have a lot of French friends and I've repeatedly gone back. And then I discovered Provence in 2015. And uh, it was a friend who suggested that I take the family there. And we, um, I came down this hill, we went to this hilltop village and we came down, I came down the hill and saw the little cafe life and a lot of chatting and a lot of cafe and a lot of um and then smelled the boulangerie and the the bells of the church went off and were started to chime and i thought you know if everything goes south this is not a bad place to, to go and then and then actually i kept i came back and back and it it spoke to me this it spoke to me my uh spoke to a deep place in my heart this this particular village and I got to know the locals uh, which really opened up a whole nother world and which I hope the character that's what I was hoping for for this character to open up this world that's not just the tourist looking from the outside but the deeper inside and the restaurant owners and yeah yeah well she does sort of open up and unfold you know, while in Provence, and we've been talking about place, place is such a big, the importance of place uh, is such a big sort of theme in this work. What is it about place, do you think, that that changes us so much? Mm, good question. So place, um, well, I mean, our identity is often wrapped up in the place where mm -hmm. we grow up so or where we travel to and i think um in ilsa ilsa's case her place was this small isolated island uh peninsula on the biggest island in the world but she um yes so her character was formed in a way by the mentality of the there is sort of a, a general stereotypical mentality in certain places and uh certainly in the nordic environment it might be a little less emotionally um uh, available mm -hmm. in some of the people that she met and so i think um yeah so that sort of informed her character and i think yeah i think you know if you have to bundle up every day before you go out if if the temperature is 40 degrees in the hottest day of the week of the year um mm -hmm. It, it's different from a place like on the Mediterranean where you don't have to wear, you can just wear a bathing suit all day long. And uh, so I think place and travel um, are important for self identity and um, are, are um, formative in oneself. Yeah. yeah. Another theme is translation, um, which is Elsa's job as a, a literary translator, but also these other ideas of translation are sort of woven beautifully throughout this narrative, translation of different forms of love, for example. Can you speak to that? Sure. Um, so the original title, my working title was Translating Love. And I thought, okay, it's hard enough to translate a language 
and um, then a place and adapting to these language plays and then how does one translate love and you know there are the love languages and there are the greek versions of the love and but um every, there are just as many versions of love as there are translated words so it um yeah so i i put the challenge in front of this translator character and she had a version of her father and her brother and an ex-boyfriend and then by going to Provence and meeting an elderly poet who shared her love of words and she'd never had that sort of intellectual uh, kind of uh, meeting companionship um, understanding and that that was life-changing for her really and then and then her the, the poet's son offers another type of love so she um she in the book she sort of navigates and hopefully because i won't give out give, give a spoiler hopefully she makes the right choice as she navigating these different and she's learning about what what is what is the right love for her what is the right translation will she be able to translate um yeah will she, well i guess it's a dual, you know, will her her um, love choice be able to translate her and will she translate him? <laughs> yeah. Complicated. Yes, but but beautifully done in the work. Um, this is your third novel. What is your, what's your process like? Um, when you sort of get that, that first sort of spark of, of an idea, um, and then to to first draft, and then to to completed work that you're that you're handing in. What does what does that look like for you? Yeah, well, I I think um, for me, it's first the feeling out what the right topic is, right? What the right subject matter is, and it's usually a question that I'm that's been agitating me and bothering mm -hmm. me, and in the other two books, uh, they were definitely, and usually I find out the answer after I've written the book. So it's, as I go, I'm realizing, oh, this is why I'm writing this book. I had to figure this out. Um, but so, but the process is generally, once I get a topic or a concept or vague idea, then I do a lot of research and do notes. So I start taking notes um, about, all kinds of aspects. And sometimes I have different notebooks for different themes that'll come up in the book that I know I want to involve in the book. Mm -hmm. So then once I've done enough kind of getting to know the territory, then I I will sit down and do a, a vague plot outline. Mm -hmm. And then once I got a vague plot outline, then I'll do a more detailed outline. And then after that, so the writing comes later for me because I, and then I have to know my character pretty well before mm -hmm. I start writing or the characters. And so I will have collected a lot of information about what they eat, what they drink, what they carry in their pockets, what they, what they like, what they don't like for each character. And so then then I'm ready. It's like having all the ingredients for the recipe right in front of you. And then you can start stirring it up uh, mm -hmm. when you know what, you, what ingredients. Sometimes it's hard to find the right ingredients. Yeah. And sometimes you have to have a spice, a little area for your spice and your salt. And your, <laughs> so, so that's kind of what happens. And then, uh, yeah. And then the first draft is very rough. And then I go back and edit it many many times and then and then only at the very last of those drafts do I show it to my agent and I've had I've had three agents over my time um one passed away sadly and then one retired and then this is my last this is my last agent that I'm gonna have because <laughs> he, he, he's a keeper he's a how uh you mentioned sort of keeping these lists about your characters and sort of getting to know these characters. How, uh, 
how did they come to you? Are you sort of free writing and 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 writing through it to kind of get to know them? Did they kind of just sort of pop into your head? I always find it so interesting. It seems very different for for different people how that works. Yeah, I guess that is interesting. I guess with Ilsa, the translator, mm-hmm. I knew she was going to be from the north. So again, that thing about place yeah. would form her as who she was. And she's a little shy and modest. And um, so, uh, you know, it's definitely elements of oneself that go into most of these characters. So it's not like they just drop from nowhere and it's magic. It mm-hmm. does, it is elements probably because one hopes to know oneself best of all the people one knows but or family members but it's mostly I think my my main character has parts of myself but not entirely myself I mean she would develop her own and and I say develop or I would develop her not as me but as a sort of compilation of of uh people I've not necessarily people well um personalities that I've come into contact with in my life. Mm-hmm. Prior to writing novels, you were a personal finance columnist for Cosmopolitan Magazine, and you were also a full-time freelance writer for Institutional Investor, among other national magazines. How did you make the journey from finance columnist to novelist? That's a great question. Well, <laughs> that's a real dip into who I am. I not um I am not a finance person, and that's why Helen Gurley Brown hired me at the time, <laughs> because she her first question to me was um when we had sat, sat down for an interview, she said, "Have you ever bounced a check?" This is back in the day when we had checkbooks, and, and I said, "Wow, this is a this is a tricky question because <laughs> yes, I have bounced a check." So I told the truth. I said, yes, I've bounced a check. She said, you're hired because the, she had previously had a writer who knew too much about finance and her audience was not, uh, was not able to enjoy her, was not able to understand the language. There's a translation element, element again. Yeah. So I was, I was translating finance for the Cosmo reader mm-hmm. and, uh, and then um, an institutional investor again. So I I started, I really am a novelist. I'm a storyteller from the beginning, but I did this as a, um, a way to make money as a writer and uh, um, to get my, my work published. So, and I could basically pretty much just like I tried to figure out what I could write about Greenland without having been there. I did find out about finance without having much background in financial education or, but I, uh, yes. Yeah, so I originally, I was always a storyteller, but the, the, the finance aspect was where I, I was a researcher more than a, a writer really. And I could do fresh, I could do fresh and <laughs> in the world of Cosmo, I could do fresh and frisky, but, um, but uh, the the work was more of a um, research and mm-hmm. and writing journalism journalism pieces was more research related for me. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And then, how did you transition over into writing novels? What was the road to publication like for you for the first yeah. novel? Well, I did, um, I started a writer's group. That was the first thing I did in my uh, community in Greenwich, Connecticut at the Parrot Library. We were called Pens of Parrot and I gathered writers and we challenged each other to come up with a chapter a month and read it. Uh, So that was one aspect. And then I took a course at um, Marymount. I was living in Connecticut at the time and it was uh, the first session was bring your first chapter of your novel. And so that required me to re- write, 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 uh, rewrite the first chapter. And um, and I thought, but, but before that, I thought, okay, if I'm going to be writing a book, it should be about 
something I love. If I'm going to be spending mm -hmm. two years with this book, it should be. So I love friends and I love fashion. And so that was the dressmaker. That's how the dressmaker came about because I just wanted to, to be dwelling in the world of things that I was passionate about. And, and that's, and then, and then I, I found my agent and she, she actually, I got very lucky. She liked the book. We didn't do that much editing. And I so saw my first book, I got lucky and she found a publisher, but um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's a long road for every book. It's different. It's a different. Well, what experience. was, what was it like for the second one then? The second one, um, the second one was, was a little more complicated because I met with my editor and my agent my first agent had passed away, which was so sad to me. So I was with my second agent. She was fantastic. Um, she's now retired. But she um, she and my editor and I got together and sort of, I had the concept, which was, it was called The Runaway Wife, the book. And actually it was called The Hermitess. So that's a very different title from The Runaway Wife. Mm -hmm. um, the mm -hmm. female hermit and The Runaway Wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I had, I had the characters, I had the first four chapters, we met, and there was like this meeting of minds, and we were like, well, maybe she could do this, and maybe she could do this, and, and um, so in a way, it was a little tricky, because I was trying to please people while I was writing it, even mm -hmm. though uh, in the end, it was entirely my book, but the process, I learned about the process by having that experience, that it's, for me, it's probably better to to just uh, write the whole thing, definitely have a good draft and then show mm -hmm. it. But, um, and then it became right at one point, um, the hermit, female hermit chapter was going to be taken out. And I was like, no, you can't take out the female hermit. That's the reason that was, she was the inspiration for that book. And I thought, if she goes, that's, that's really not, not a good thing. So it's interesting. Yeah, what happens along the way? How um, how do you find your community of writers? Are you still in a writing group, or what does that look like for you? Well, I I I am lucky in that I have a a group that's, that is a women's writers group, um, and we do meet periodically and and at people's how uh, people's apartments and we we support each other and so online if someone's published a book we we tag them in our instagrams and our facebook and so we it's a really great supportive network that we've developed that was developed not by me but by roxana robinson and a few other people um so that is wonderful but um and before that uh, before I knew of that group. And I do have lovely writer friends who I stay in touch with. Uh, and before that group, I, I think the the taking a class is really helpful. Like what I did at Marymount was, uh, was wonderful. And even starting a group and asking at the library who are the writers and uh, that starting that group was really the ticket for me to being focused and have, being accountable. Because uh, I was still doing the freelance, but I knew I wanted to to break into the novel writing. What is your daily writing routine like now? Okay, well, <laughs> depends. <laughs> I, wish I were. I don't know what if you what you do, Kelly, but I wish I every time every year I think okay, this is the year I'm going to start the five thirty a.m. thing and go till one in the afternoon and then have a great lunch and then take care of the rest of my life. <laughs> okay. It is. And, and then sometimes I do get some, I have a library near me in, uh, in New York and uh, New York society library. And sometimes I do the days that I go there, but you have to start at nine because that's when it opens. Mm -hmm. Those are the really great productive days. Cause it's very specific. It's, 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 it's like, the, the just the distractions are few but mm -hmm. it is difficult I mean I turn off my phone I ideally I do 
you know, eight in the morning till 11 or 12 or one. But um, I'm often have things that are going on that distract me. And so I grab, I grab whatever time in a way when you don't have a lot of time, it makes the focus more intense. Mm -hmm. So my justification for, for not <laughs> being as disciplined as I should be. Well, whatever you're doing is working. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. What you mentioned that you've always been a storyteller. How did you, how did you come to writing? What do you have an earliest sort of memory? Have you always been a writer? Yes, I think I have actually. Um, um, I I just my mother kept some of my early stories, and I would give as gifts for Christmas. And um, I love that in all those I give stories that I wrote so I and then we had a newspaper in our family and I was the editor of the newspaper that came out every Saturday or whatever and so I was feel like that was my expressive I even remember riding around on a bicycle in my early teens and just thinking up stories like that was my thing that I did it that was just like what I did and I would think up really in the early days it was animal stories <laughs> and later it was a little more fun detective whatever but but yeah so I, I guess I've always been in that mode of tales telling tales and uh, writing mostly writing rather than telling generally yeah what do you know now that you wish you had known before publishing your first novel hmm. uh, well I, I I suppose it would be um, staying true to your uh, staying true to 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 your essence saying staying true to um, and not so I I tended to in the earlier days to to do a lot of pleasing you know to mm -hmm. to um so I th I would say it would be the the thing that I wish I had known is number one just keep writing as much as possible and and you can use all that writing but number two to uh whatever you're writing stick to it and keep after it and mm -hmm. don't get swayed. You know, there are a lot of trends and there are a lot of, um, there are the best, you know, you're thinking, oh, bestsellers and you're thinking, so I think, I think the most, and you know, you're trying to make some money doing this as well. So there is that pull of what's best selling and what's going to um, satisfy the soul. So that is a the pull in, but I would say, the satisfying the soul should take precedence mm. <laughs> over the a desire to be published and sell. I mean, you, you have to be, you want to be published as a writer. So you do have to make things, for example, in this book. And I always gave way, you know, what the, the runaway wife versus the hermitess. There's no doubt that the runaway wife was a better title. In this case, in this case, it was, um, the title had to have Provence in it because that was a good sell. If you have wife in it, that's a really good word. Provence, <laughs> anything France, Paris, the Paris wife is a perfect title. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you definitely have to have your eye on the marketability of your book for sure. Mm -hmm. But I would say staying true to yourself with an eye on the marketability of your book is the best answer to that question yeah well and kind of carrying on from that what is your best advice for early career writers okay I would say um start a writer's group I would say I would say um do carve out on your calendar uh every month you know three hours two hours two hours if you've got the other job that you're going to mm -hmm. so two hours um a day 
to get in and out of your work and um and to and i guess the the biggest the biggest gift i think one can give to oneself as a as a as a writer is the ability to daydream mm -hmm. and the ability to sit and really um uh take in and take in what you what you want to explore to really um explore ex to to discover to discover so i think daydreaming is is really important and you know actually that brings to mind that wonderful um cameron book the artist's way julia cameron and that book was amazing i think that's that's a wonderful accompaniment to a young a new writer not necessarily a young a new writer is Julia Cameron and she's she was all about support groups and and I I you know did her book because you kind of have to do it it's a workshop book and it's about opening up have you done it have you done that book? I have done parts of it but I don't think I I've actually done it the whole way through you know what I mean exactly did you did you do I, the whole thing I would go to the library and and, you know, they have these, she had these questions like, what was the criticism that stopped you? What was, what did your English teacher say in sixth grade that, that stopped you? And, and, and so you explore these things, these, the limits that you put on yourself or other, what you think other people put on you, which really is one person in your whole life has said one thing. And then you, you take that in. So it was that kind of self-discovery about who you are as a writer and what your limits are and what how you're going to free yourself and how you're going to inspire yourself. And there's they, she has these little quotes by, you know, those little quotes of writers that mm -hmm. are inspiring. And I would take one of those and put it on my uh, my desk, you know, to to get me going. And then there was also this other great thing. It was called the Writer's Toolbox. Had you ever hear about that? It's called the Writer's Toolbox. I don't and think so. I Rudell or R U D E L L. Anyway, this was a little box and it had cards in it. And so every morning I would just pick a card and it had a prompt of to do like today, look around you and you know, describe color as if you've never seen color before, as if you've lived in a black and white world or, you know, so every, so that was a great, um, it's called the writer's toolbox. And I think it's still available. Uh, so these little helpers, and then currently I do have a friend and we, we give each other prompts once a week. So every Thursday morning at 645, we call each other and she we rotate who gives the prompt and we write for seven minutes that's all seven minutes on a subject and so when we time it and then we're finished at 7 15 so it's, it's a half an hour total we read each other what we wrote and then we comment on it and then but it's a kind of see these are these little things that keep you in the writing world yeah, yeah. i yeah. love that okay so once a week you rotate prompts. Yes. Seven yeah. minutes. Seven minutes. It's not a lot. I mean, it's, it's perfect. Yes. That's great. That's just very doable, you yeah. know, and sort it, of like gets you into the, it gets you there, right? Like into that mindset and gets you going. And if you haven't written for a week, you will have written one page of seven yeah. minutes that week. So on a topic that you might never have thought of. So. That's oh, really that's, fun. that's great. I can't wait. I'm going to try this. <laughs> All right. We have a traditional last question on the podcast and it has to do with music. It is when a Northern light in Provence is made into a movie or series, what do you think the theme song should be? Oh my goodness. Oh, well, it would have to be it would have to be a French, it would have to be a French song. Yeah. Um, although I'm sure the Greenlandic 
music is folk interesting is interesting but i think we'd have to the theme song would have to be french and it would probably um uh let's think of who it would be i mean we could do carla bruni or there's sandrine kimberlin um or the great old eddie mitchell um yeah one of one of their la vie en rose or one of the the classic um one of the classic french french songs that uh, yeah. <laughs> i look forward to the movie <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> together <laughs> Elizabeth Berkland, thank you so much for coming on. It has been wonderful having the chance to talk with you. Thank you. Thanks for hosting me. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thanks for joining us on Literary Prospects. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. We'll see you next time.